What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bodacious Rant. Hope everybody's having a great week. I, myself, am the awesome Ryan. There's Burn. That's all I'm going to stick with. I'm just kidding. He's, he's, he's handsome and bodacious, Burn. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you beautiful son of a bitch, you. Anyways, uh, we are talking more this week. Of course, you guessed it. Uh, the Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 6, Slash Chapter 22. And uh, before we get started with our spoilers, please do not forget to give us a like, ring the bell, and of course, subscribe. We really do appreciate it and want to keep everything going, you know, because we love you guys, we love pop culture, we love content, so let's all bask in this glory together. Um, so, I, I feel like, okay, this is not necessarily, this is kind of like a little nitpick slash critique. I feel like this is one of the episodes that definitely... After what happened last week and stuff, I felt like we have more of a direction going, and this kind of kept it. But with all the with that ending, with that um, that post credit scene essentially last week with the whole Moff Gideon supposedly escaping, you think there would be a little more hint of that in this episode, but it kind of didn't. So this was the first moment I'm like I could see fans critiquing this by kind of being all over the place story wise. So that's just that was just I don't know if you had that same thought process at all. I maybe I'm just overthinking it. But uh, I just want to get your no, feedback on I'm, that. I'm definitely, I'm, once the end of this episode happened, I'm like, people are either going to really like this or they're going to hate it. Like it, it seemed like one of those episodes where, yeah, like you said, well, especially coming off of last week's episode, it seemed like this one could seem a little bit disjointed. Yeah, like it still ties into like uh, the narrative that we've been getting so far. Um, but the way they did it was, I, I can see a little bit controversial for, for some people. And I, and I do have my... But gripes with it, but you know, we'll, we'll we get to it when we get more into the deep dive. But overall, I mean, I did enjoy it. Yeah, no, me too. I'm not saying anything about that, but this is one I thought, like, man, I guess I could, I could see people's frustrations with it because we only have two more episodes after this now. So it's like, and yet it still feels like we're almost at a halfway point when this is like the last few episodes that we kind of really should start feeling momentum building. So the last two are really gonna have to end the season on a bang, or else I. In all honesty, I don't know how much more Mando seasons of Mando they could really do. Even though there've been uh, reports and like Favreau saying, "Oh, this show can go on for God knows how long, as long as we want it to." Really, it's like uh, after the way this season's doing, you you may not have much longer to be honest. But whatever, that's just me being super nitpicky. So I'm sure there are a couple of you guys are thinking that too. At least we're all in the same same thought process. But uh, I thought that this was actually one of the best cameo episodes ever. Where it's like, dude, we had the trifecta of just the, amazing people. This was the cameo episode. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> like they, they jam packed them all here. <laughs> like I thought it was cool that in the beginning we got to see where, you know, the the night owls are essentially at. Like the rest of her, you know, Mandalorian following were with the uh, with the fleet that they stole from Moff Gideon and the other em- em- remnants of the Empire, where they had to get the the Mon Calamari prince or or son, and take him back home, even though he's in love with that. Um, I forgot what that squid head person, what those species are called. Quarren, I think. Quarren. Quarren, something like that. Yeah, because I know ever since, like, I remember ever since Gennady Tartakovsky's uh, Star Wars, like his Clone Wars run, you definitely got the vibe that those, those that species of alien was always the bad guy. And the Mon Calamari are the ones who have to really defend themselves from someone. But I thought that was kind of a cool little tie-in to see where they were at and how they're mercenaries for hire. And I thought personally it was it was ironic that he's like, oh, we're very loyal people. You know, we have to do our job. It's like, really, Axe, you're really going to say you're loyal after you just dipped on uh, Bo-Katan because she didn't get the Darksaber? Like, you bitch. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, and I think Casca says like right after, like, we're, we're like, we're very loyal for the for right price or something. So, yeah, they're very much uh, the title of the episode, Guns for Hire. <laughs> and it's it's just funny. Like, we'll talk more about that a little bit. And when we get to the end of this, I like, talk about over the overall thing, but I think that's just hilarious coming from them after all the shit from season two, from episode two. La- no, it's season two. I'm sorry. Um, and then when they find that outer rim planet, because that's where the, you know, the crew is essentially stationed at at the moment. I thought, I thought it was almost like if you had to put Disney World in space, that's what it would look like. You know, like if if like because how it has like the giant dome, there's green everywhere. I just kept thinking, I'm like, yeah. if that's it, you take the little tram, yeah, to, like, exactly. Get there. The hyper, the little okay. hyperpop yeah. thing was like, oh my god, it's like the monorail. You're going from the parking lot over there. So that's just that's just what I was thinking. I was like, man, this is like, <laughs> like Disney's really putting their foot down, saying this is what it's like if you go to Disney World here. Um, 
But that's when we see some of the best cameos when they walk in because they had, um, the rulers of this planet demand uh, presence with Bo-Katan and Din. And it's um, as soon as he started talking, I was like, no fucking way. Is that is it? And then as soon as you get close up, it's Jack Black and his wife is Lizzo in this episode, which was like, what the shit? <laughs> and I know I was talking to you about this before, Bird. Like, it was kind of out of left field, mm-hmm. Lizzo. But if She-Hulk can get Megan Thee Stallion on, on that show, then, Liz, then it's perfect that Star Wars got Lizzo. They got to get somebody, you know? Yeah, and I mean, like, it was so funny because, like, I heard Jack Black's voice and I was like, no way, that's Jack Black. Because the first shot is, like, from super far away. And I was like, dude, they got, they got Jack Black. They're like, that's so cool. And, and yeah, like, li- like having Lizzo there, too. Like, I wondered just, like, how much of, like, a fans they both are, you know, to, like, cameo here. Like, is it one of those things where they really like Star Wars or they just really wanted to work with Bryce Dallas Howard? Who knows? But it's, like, it's really cool that we got them, too, and... And Christopher Lord, who's coming up in a little bit here, too, is like just like crazy. Like the cameo episode, basically. I think Christopher Lloyd melted my heart the most because I'm like, oh, my God. Like he's been mm-hmm. a staple in so much Disney shit for a long time. And he's one of like, my favorite pop culture icons. Like he was part of Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Back to the Future. And those are, like my two favorite movies growing up as a kid, which is kind of fucked up, especially Who Framed Roger Rabbit, because there's some messed up uh, subtleties in there. But. That's not anything or there. I thought it was a fucked up that she, they're like, oh, Grogu doesn't take kindly to strangers because she wanted to hold the baby. I thought it was going to be like a sinister thing at one point. Like, I thought they were going to like blackmail Bo and Din for a, a little bit. I don't know if you felt that way, but that's just how I felt. Like, these people are super happy living in this lush dome. And it's like, now you mm-hmm. want these two Mandalorians just to essentially help you with something? Like, something doesn't seem right here, you know? Yeah, like it, because it, this very much felt like a utopia. You know, it's like okay, what is what's going on here? Usually, you know, when things look really good on the outside, there's something uh, like there's a big underlying issue on the inside. But you know that I, that wasn't the case for the most part here. I mean, there are there was a, a little bit of a conspiracy that unraveled throughout the episode, but not one that I thought was like super detrimental or anything like that. Like I thought it was yeah, it was gonna be some really messed up stuff with either like Jack Black or, or Lizzo, and some bad was gonna be like going on in this planet that otherwise look like it was very very nice it's like okay it looks too good especially in 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 like the world of star wars where everything's a little bit run down and gritty you know and and a little bit dirty and here was just like pristine yeah but what was messed up is like can i hold him it's like he doesn't take kind of strangers flashes food at that child and he freaking flips jedi flips over to i was like like where is your loyalty you little brat but i guess obviously it's food um and I thought that it was interesting that they use like old Imperial, like no, not Imperial, but like Clone Wars and actually Imperial droids too. I thought that was a kind of a neat little take, especially because you see Din kind of become almost like, um, oh my God, what's his face from Last of Us? Uh, oh my God, I can't think of it. Like Joel? Joel, thank you. Like Joel? I felt like he had his Joel <laughs> moment where he's just like, oh, I don't like droids. Like, <laughs> um, oh. like just very much like he just had like an old person moment, essentially just an old grudge. <laughs> Um, just you know din's racism against droid was was on full display this episode the, the man you give that man a badge and he was just he was wielding it with with without prejudice with prejudice i thought it was very interesting this is almost like a very noir like episode you know where it's like oh yeah for sure i thought that was an interesting little theme to do it and bryce tell how directing it did a great job but the fact that they had to find out why these droids are you know, essentially malfunctioning and wreaking havoc, potentially hurting people. Um, I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty good episode overall with that plot point where Din, the, the chase with that battle droid that Din and Bo had, that was really well done. And in the end, we find out, and I, th- I thought it was a very interesting perspective from the bartender droid when they go to, um, I forgot that, that bar for droids, but I thought it was interesting that the bartender's like, we were built by organics, so we want to, give some service like that just feels right to us it's like never really thought about it that way like i knew we had c3po r2 astrojoids kind of help out with like mechanics and stuff but never really thought that that was something they wanted you know or something that they could really think about but um, it kind of makes sense like or am i again am i just being like not looking into it as much no, no. I mean, like, yeah, it, it 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 does bring up a lot of very interesting questions, especially with how Star Wars treats um, droids. Like, are they like their own like sentient beings, or are they just you know programming? It's like they're they're kind of like having their cake and eating it too a little bit, you know, with uh, how they're treating <laughs> treating these droids. Where it's like, yeah, you know, they're they're 
meant for like certain services and and different like directives and, but at the same time do they also have like feelings and stuff and it seems like they do both so it's like bring, brings into question like oh man why are they treated like like slave labor then but apparently here they say like they they want to be of service like that is their thing that like they do not want to be replaced by humans in the workforce which which is an interesting flip on like you know how things are you know, in the real world where we're like, oh man, machines are going to eventually take all our jobs away. Here, it's the opposite. The machines are the ones worried about humans replacing them. And, and yeah, I think um, it's interesting how this, basically this, like this planet sort of fits into the theme or what seems to be one of the big themes of, of the season of like rehabilitation and stuff and how all these uh, droids that are working here are all reprogrammed droids from the clone wars you know they were they were warrior droids they were battle droids and and here they're doing you know just menial tasks or uh, or just everyday tasks that they weren't initially programmed for so i thought that was interesting to sort of like tie that into the whole um you know the whole rehabilitation that's going on with the new republic and stuff it was just very interesting overall i think it's all about yeah it's really all about redemption this season and second chances to see who's really worthy of it essentially like bo and den um, and, you know, Moff apparently, but not really. And like Katie O'Brien's character, um, I forget her name, but that Imperial officer, basically all the Imperial officers of essentially Star Wars paperclip, essentially. So, um, very, yeah, very good pickup on that burn. Um, and it was just a bummer that Christopher, I mean, I kind of saw it coming. I was like, Christopher Lloyd has been a bad guy in some of these movies. So it's, it makes sense. He turned out to be the last like living separatist, unfortunately, and it was, it was just like an interesting perspective because I know we were talking about right before that in a way, when you look at the original prequels and stuff, it's like, yeah, the Separatists weren't the best. They definitely did some bad things. They essentially set the foundation of the Empire, but they're also under the direction of, you know, uh, Palpatine playing both sides. He's pulling a Mac throughout those whole movies. And um, that, Do that Count Dooku and all them, they just wanted peace throughout the galaxy, that the Republic was becoming too powerful and basically putting its foot down on everybody. So I thought that was an interesting perspective to kind of bring that back into light. And it's the first time we've heard separatists in like God knows how mm -hmm. long, especially in something live action, you know? Yeah. Like the, him having that, you know, Dooku was right moment, you know, like right, right as he's like giving his monologue. So yeah, it sort of like reframes um, the, the, the events of you know, the clone wars. Like you said, uh, where initially we were like watching those movies. It's like, Oh yeah, the separatists are the bad guys. Like clearly, but of course they were just another pawn in, in Palpatine's, you know, big game that, that he played on everybody. So it's like, yeah, they were framed as the villains there, but in hindsight, they weren't nearly as bad as what the empire turned out to be. So, so yeah, it's just like the, the recontextualizing of past events is, is, it's fun, you know, especially now that they're sort of linking the, you know, the, it, it seems like Mando of, of all the Star Wars properties is doing a good job in linking all the different eras or the three big eras of Star Wars that we've gotten so far in the prequel, original trilogy. And I'm, I'm sure they're laying a lot of groundwork for what happens in the sequels, uh, sequel trilogy. But yeah, it's, it's kind of cool that um, that they're doing that with, with this show and, and, you know, the three seasons that we've gotten so far. And, and just this, yeah, this moment with Christopher Lloyd and, and his uh, monologue was Again, a really cool thing to look back at the Clone Wars and stuff, especially with all these battle droids that we've got running around and just hearing their voices is a little bit nostalgic, you know, just they're they're they're, dumb, they're, they're like dumb personalities. But but yeah, it's a lot of fun uh, seeing them in in a different uh, setting, basically. Yeah, that's just a very. Con yeah, like you like like we said, it's just it's almost twisting the Separatist version around on itself and saying these droids were literally just pawns in a scheme same with the separatists themselves but they all wanted they were all fighting for peace essentially in their own time so a uh, very great way of doing that and uh, i like that you know of Bo and didn't finally catch up with the night owls and axe is just uh, almost like a ram he kind of reminded me of like ramsey bolton a little bit where he's just sitting down in the field just eating his lunch with his army like the the, the fleet behind him essentially and i like the little the little battle they had together was great because I felt like I haven't really seen that in a while, or at least like two Mandos like really go at it. Because I mean, I don't really count Boba and Casca kind of going at it last season because it was just a quick little skirmish, a little disagreement. This was like a true challenge of leadership. So I thought that was really fun, especially when uh, with like the flamethrower, the shields, and the grapples, and you know the tackle and grapple. Um, but 
the biggest thing, which I'm like now, like I kind of had the moment I was watching it this morning. I was like, really? Now you wait to do this? Where Din says, well, technically I lost a dark saber to this creature that captured me on Mandalore. She defeated that creature. And it was like, so technically it's hers, right? And Axe just has begrudgingly said like, yes, yes, it's hers. Like, that's right, you bitch. Um, but like I said, back to the whole thing we were talking about a few minutes ago where it's ironic. They said, oh, we're, we're loyal to the right price. It's like, you guys are true Mandalorians and you're shitting on people like the Watch. Who've never, most of them probably never been to Mandalore. But I like that she finally, because she's seen it from this point of view that, hey, he's taken the creed. He's walked the path of like our ancestors, like true warrior people. So yeah, he's definitely more than any of us was. Like, you, just because we're from, it's essentially saying just because you're from there doesn't mean, you know, you're you're hundred. Like, how do I put this? Like, because you're from there doesn't mean you're you're better than them. Essentially, it's like it just depends how you go about it. Mm -hmm. Or they just that there isn't one way to be a Mandalorian. Like, obviously, you have the people that were from Mandalore and were scattered off and did their own thing, and then you have people that you know took the creed and and did like I guess the, the old ancestors did, and that's what kind of the children of the Watch are. They're you know they're a throwback to the very very old ways of of the Mandalorian. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, it's, again, it's very like hypocritical when one side says you're not a Mandalorian really because of this reason when they have their own traditions that they, you know, it's, it's weird. Like, yeah, like the whole, yeah, you, you guys take your masks off. So just so you guys aren't real, but it's like, oh, but you know, we have the, the dark saber and we have to follow this person. So yeah, everyone's got their own particular ways of doing it. So it, it's frustrating. It's like, just you're all Mandalorian, right? Just just get together and, you know, just <laughs> take this planet back. Stop being idiots. You're just in the background. Just just do it, okay? Just stop it. Stop being stupid. We're all Mandalorians, okay? We're all in. <laughs> it's like we just got to tell a Mandalorian together strong. Okay? And, then I, and I just tell Burn, Burn don't, don't, don't stir up the brothers now. Come on, please relax. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah the, the the whole you know section uh and the whole fight sequence that they have is really cool like you said the choreography was was a lot of fun really felt like they they made a lot of use of um of the different gadgets that the mandalorians have you know the jetpacks the you know the grapple and stuff it, it was all really cool and, and the fight was was pretty interesting although i do gotta say it, it did look like they, they they filmed it in a park you know like it was just kind of like a little bit distracting on the sense but i can forgive it you know it's like not one of those big detriments but it's like it's like mm. it does like you like you guys like found a nice open plane and something and decided to film the film there but other than that you know the, the, the fight itself was really cool you have the local workout group just watching these people do stunts and it's like what the fuck is this why the fuck are they ruining our workout why the fuck it's like just off screen you know there's a yoga class going on right now they're just looking over like what? I mean, I, if I were those people in the park, I'm like, dude, like, I'm gonna do my crunches closer to them so I can, so I can like see the spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I just, but it's like Din finally gave her the dark saber, and you know he he picked his own loophole, and I'm I'm honestly fine with that. I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of people like, no, he should have kept it. Yeah, but it's like that's not the story I I envisioned for him. You know, just because how it's been mostly themed like a Western show and he's kind of the lone outlaw. It's like rarely ever does the outlaw become the mayor or the sheriff or, you know, something like that. They usually always kind of either die or ride off into the sunset in their own ways. So <laughs> I'm kind of glad that he gave it up. I don't know how you felt about that little uh, development. Yeah. And, and it made sense, too, because I remember um, when episode two like aired and and people in like the subreddits were saying, wait, shouldn't uh, Bo have the rightful claim now? Because, you know, everyone caught on to that, like the whole technicality of you know, he lost to this creature. She beat the creature. So it should be the thing, you know, like she should be the one to wield it. It's like, yeah, you know, that, that definitely makes sense. And I think, you know, this the time that he decided to give it to her was probably the best time because he handed it to her. You know, like when it was just the two of them in that cave, um, I think a lot of people would have been hesitant to accept, you know, like, oh, OK, like she just has it now. Like, how do we know that you didn't just hand it to her because you didn't want it initially in the first place? So. So, yeah, the, for him making a big show of it in front of everyone, uh, I think was a smart move. So there isn't like that sort of like questioning of whether she is, has a legitimate claim or not. 
Uh, I mean, although it, it, they can definitely say, oh, like, I, I don't believe your story, <laughs> you know, but, but, um, but I mean, that, that's going to, we're going to have to see if, um, if that does come into play at some point, but, but yeah, uh, like you said, the, the way that Din's character is, he's, he's the drifter, you know, he's the man with no name. He's the, he's the guy that comes into like different situations and, and deals with it. He's not like you said, the, the mayor or the king or the person that's the leader. Although it could be interesting, you know, he, it's always interesting when characters like that, you know, they're the reluctant, um, the reluctant leader. Um, they could definitely play into that trope if they wanted to, but I think they have different, um, different ideas in mind for, for Din and his character. Yeah. I mean, either I wouldn't mind if he rides off in the sunset or becomes Bo's, uh, you know, Bo or, you know, her man, and how, and be, be like the first the first husband of Mandalore, you know how she's yes, the ruler. The, I would the, love to see that. I, I never thought about that before, <laughs> but this scene's made me think. You know what? I want to ship Bo and Din. I think that needs to Dinbo. happen. Yes. Dinbo, Dinbo, Bowden, whatever you want. <laughs> Bowen. Uh, I'm I'm team them. You know, just them two. And they both have their own depression chairs. You know, little Grogu has his little uh, high chair too along there. It's a great, great family. <laughs> it would it would be a great family, but yeah, like I said, that was disappointing that there was no like sort of post credit scene, and that just didn't really hint at the Moff Gideon thing. So that's what I'm saying. Hopefully, the next two episodes are really gonna be action packed, or at least very very developing, kind of like uh, season like you know the episode of like the last two episodes of season one, and maybe even two, where it definitely started leading up to a point. Um, other than that, um, yeah. anything else that caught your episode, your eye this episode, Burn? Well, I mean, just to to elaborate on, like, just to go off of your last point, yeah, like it does feel like you know this being uh, the sixth episode with only two more left. It felt like, you know, as fun as this was, like this definitely felt like a like a Clone Wars episode, and in, in like the the best ways, like live action Clone Wars, like come to life with the way the stories played out in in that animated show. Um, yeah, it it does feel like I can definitely see, and and I do have a little bit of these gripes too, but we won't really know until this the season's over. But but yeah, like it felt like the focus of this episode really should have been the events of the last five minutes. You know, the them like getting the the clan back and us learning a little bit more about them and what was going on. Because yeah, we only we do only have two or more episodes to wrap this story up. And and it, you know in the last two seasons they've it's kind of been the same way too where the last two episodes are the ones that really like kick things into into high gear and stuff so well I mean there's definitely up to up to you know whatever happens in these next couple of weeks to really solidify whether this season was a hit or not but in you know in the the context of this episode just you know this episode in isolation this was a lot of fun i think but but yeah in terms of like how it fits into you know the season as a whole it, it could end up being detrimental if um these last two don't nail it yeah you i think you put it perfectly burn but everybody else what did you what did you all think of this episode did you love it did you hate it, especially because it felt like a detraction? Did you love the cameos like we did? Are you excited for the last two? Uh, let us know in the comments. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Uh, stay tuned. Super Mario uh, movie did come out this week, along with the with the Ben Affleck movie Air. Uh, we are going to go see those and most likely review them. Partially just kind of a sucker for Ben Affleck stuff, and it's Mario. You got to see it, especially because the animation looks on point. So stay tuned for those reviews. And, of course, guys, please uh, do not... Oh, I'm actually one of my kids. I'm sorry, I got distracted. As always, stay bodacious and keep on ranting for the both of us. Absolutely, everybody. Be good, be safe, and as always, we'll catch y'all on the next one.